SpaceX recently switched from Krypton to Argon with their new V2 minis, but those thrusters seem to be having trouble. Is Argon to blame? I ask Jonathan McDowell in this SpaceX update. The shuttle has cleared the tower. Maybe you know that I covered the first Starlink V2 mini launch, almost missed it. And may I remind you that after this launch, we have an active movie set behind me, which is pretty cool. Project Artemis is something that they are filming here. So we hopefully we'll get a little behind the scenes look at that. That is starring Scarlett Johansson and Channing Tatum. No, I have not found them yet. I would like to, because that'd be cool. But you know, um, and this, this will be cool. It's a film set in the 1960s, space race era and it will be released on Apple TV, which some of you seem to indicate you were not a fan of. Oh, wow. Oh my gosh. I'm blind. <laughs> okay, that is freaking cool. Wow. Oh my gosh, that is gorgeous. Wow. I can't believe I almost missed it. <laughs> it's so quiet. That was so cool. So yeah, we were looking at the other way, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so obviously, you know, my, my live shot didn't go so well, but we're seeing some issues and you're saying that it, it's too soon to blame the argon thrusters. Yeah, I think so. So what happened was, you know, they, they deployed uh, these 21 V2 mini satellites uh, into a 360 kilometer orbit which is about you know kind of typical a little higher than than uh, some of the other uh, starlink launches and then they right away within a couple of days they they switched on their argon thrusters and they started orbit raising and they got up to 380 and they switched them off and so they got up moved up 20 kilometers and then they just drifted in that orbit and that's sort of expected because what they're doing is checking them out and they're also letting the orbital plane drift at a certain rate to uh, at that height to, to get to the right orbital plane before they go up. And they were going to go up to, I guess, you know, 500 kilometers or so. Um, but then on March 12th, so a couple of weeks after launch, they started not, uh, so they were keep they were maintaining altitude with little bursts of the thrusters at this 380 mark. And then they started to sort of slowly drift down. Like they were no longer... Uh, no longer spritzing the thrusters. And uh, um, and then one of them started going down significantly faster, all the way back down to 360, and then leveled out. And, uh, actually, two of them did that. Clearly, something was going on. This was clearly not planned, but they're, they're probably debugging something. They're, um, uh, and it could be the thrusters, but it could be the momentum wheels. It could be the uh um it could be like any or uh, it could be the solar panels right maybe the solar panels are making enough electricity or something like that. there's a whole bunch of new stuff on these v2 minis and any one of them going wrong could uh, uh you know it could be that, that maybe they were checking out the communications equipment of the new you know new more powerful transponders or whatever and and uh and those weren't working properly and so they went well we can't put these into service so um and so so it's way too early to to judge what went wrong what we can say is that on uh, about march 24th one of the satellites satellite 30062 starlink 30062 uh started heading down a lot faster so Starlink 30062 is clearly being retired now down at about 310 kilometers. Space Force just issued its first re-entry prediction that should be April 3rd. That satellite has been written off. By the same token, the fact that the other satellites, while slowly going down, they're still up at 360, they're heading down, most of them. There's a couple that seem to be popping back up, maybe. Um, the that suggests to me that they're they're kind of being left fallow for a while while they debug things but they haven't given up on them hmm. and so we could still see in another week or so those satellites flatten out and maybe maybe orbit rays i'm not so optimistic it sounds from what i'm hearing that that uh 
there are there are a bunch of different problems and they may decide that the, this whole batch just needs to be written off. Jonathan says with individual satellites having problems, they have in the past kept them at a 350 kilometer altitude for months, fix what was wrong, and then the satellite goes up and joins its siblings in operational orbit. Well, it's clear one from the batch of 21 V2 minis is no longer. One, one satellite out of the 21, <laughs> clearly, clearly screwed, uh, but the others, still uh still too early to tell but remember this is a new satellite design when you launch a new satellite even some of the most successful ones often had teething troubles in the first few weeks the voyagers right the uh, voyager one i think it was you know was like in serious trouble for a couple of weeks after launch until they kind of debugged something on its computer or something like that so so um so it shouldn't be, you know, you can't hold this batch to the same standard as Group 510 that went up the other day, where it's the same design that they've launched thousands of, right? This right, is right. new satellite design, teething troubles are to be expected, and it's just a question of how serious they are. So far, only 21 of these V2 minis have been launched, and it's a launch that I'll never forget because, yeah, I literally almost missed the entire thing. Oh, wow. Oh my gosh, I'm blind. <laughs> the original plan was to launch a couple more batches of the V2 minis, but those have since been delayed. But you'll notice why so few of the V2s? Normal SpaceX Starlink batches are in the 50s. Well, it's because these V2 minis are actually not many at all. You can only fit 21 on a Falcon 9, and this is something Jonathan says he's seeing a lot of people become confused about. The V1.5s, right, are the, are the standard Falcon 9 Starlink. The V2s that are the promised land, uh, right, uh, are super ginormous and they're designed for Starship. And when they realized that uh, Starship wasn't going to happen quite as soon as they'd hoped, because, you know, Elon time, right, uh, the, the, uh, uh, they, they went, okay, well, let's saw a V2 in half so we can fit it in the, um, uh, uh, in the Falcon 9 bearing. <laughs> right, so we can get some of the V2 technology up there while we're waiting for Starlink. But they are many compared to the full-size V2s that Starship will soon be packing. The V1.5 is 300 kilograms. It has a single 10 meter long solar panel. Now the V2 minis are 800 kilograms. They also have about five times the surface area of a V1.5 and two massive solar panels. So they're wow. enormous satellites, but they're not as enormous as the real V2s that are sitting on the ground waiting for Starship that, that are a ton and a half, 1,500 kilograms, and, and, and have even bigger solar panels and, and, and are you know, a, a bigger basic bus size. So I still haven't adequately covered the Argon thrusters. I tried to cover this from a live stream in my hospital bed, but I wanted to revisit this. Why did SpaceX switch from Krypton to Argon? I mean, I feel like there hasn't been a lot of coverage about this and it seems like a pretty big deal. Yeah, so um, we have, uh, uh, so, so the, as I said, the V2 minis have a lot of tech that the V1s don't have. And one of the big changes is the switch from Krypton to Argon in the electric thrusters. Uh, and, uh, and so that is really because if you're going to build 30,000 of these satellites, you, you know, you can't use all the Krypton in the world. I mean, originally the V1.5s used Krypton instead of Xenon. Everybody else uses Xenon for their thrusters, uh, for their electric thrusters. And, and, uh, um, Xenon is more efficient in certain way, but it's also more expensive. And even for V1.5, there are too many Starlinks. You know, you, you would be using up the whole world xenon supply. So, uh, so they went to Krypton, cheaper and more abundant for that reason. But now they're going to argon, and argon again is it's it's slightly less efficient in principle. Although they've apparently made some real tech advances in the thruster design that give them a thruster that's basically better than the the, the uh, Starlink one point five thrusters, even with the the different propellant. And the thing about argon is argon. You're not going to run out of argon, however many Starlinks you build, because mm. argon is 
the third most common constituent of the air right it's above co2 it's it's uh right it's it's the you you all learn in school that that the air is made of nitrogen and oxygen and that's 99 percent of the air but then what most of the remaining one percent is argon mm -hmm. uh and so so it's a it's 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 one of the big constituents of air and so it's cheap and there's lots of it <laughs> and and uh, so um uh so so i think it's a really good move on spacex's part to switch to argon thrusters uh and uh they're um and making that technology mature uh you know is uh, i think other companies are likely to pick up that uh, uh that technology and and uh, um you know argon is also present in the martian atmosphere so you know you can refuel those thrusters when you get to mars and things like that right so in terms of elon's long-term vision like methane argon you know like methane instead of kerosene argon instead of xenon is is a smart move both for the short term but also for the vision of, of, of operating on mars so this switch to argon is actually extremely forward thinking and clearly someone someone we know has mars on their mind mm -hmm.